y'all this is the Dr. Nurse with the drnurse.com. Today we're going to talk about just a few common dysrhythmias and the medications or treatments to treat those. I want to thank my former student for this idea because this is a really good idea and this would have been helpful um, when I was in nursing school. So let's talk about the first dysrhythmia I have and forgive my artistic abilities here. The first one I have up here at the very top, if you want to kind of zoom in on um, the one at the top here, this is, it looks like sinus bradycardia. It's just very, very slow, um, but we're going to call it symptomatic bradycardia, okay? So symptomatic bradycardia would mean that your patient has either A, a change in their level of consciousness or B, a drop in their blood pressure or both, okay? So if your patient's rhythm is really slow and they have a mental status change or their blood pressure drops, it is then officially symptomatic bradycardia. And the way we treat that is with atropine, okay? We do 0.5 milligrams of atropine to treat symptomatic bradycardia. Now what atropine does is it blocks innervation from your vagus nerve so it stops any interaction between your vagus nerve and your SA node and we know that the vagus nerve slows down the heart rate so atropine kind of blocks that interaction and thus it's going to speed up your patient's heart rate and hopefully fix any mental status changes or blood pressure drops. All right, so that's symptomatic bradycardia. The next rhythm that I have um, right underneath the bradycardia, this is gonna be a third degree AV block or um, complete AV disassociation, um, however you wanna talk about it. But what's going on in a third degree or AV dissociation is that there's absolutely no communication between your atria and your ventral, ventricles, okay? So your, your SA node is firing, your AV node is firing, but they're not in sync, okay? It's like a, a divorced couple, okay? They're, they're, not, they're not together anymore, all right? So you've got P waves all over the place that are just kind of firing willy-nilly. You've got QRSs, complexes, but the P waves and the QRSs don't have anything to do with each other, okay? So that's our third degree. Your third degree is typically going to be very, very slow. So when you're trying to figure out if it's third degree or not, first you want to look at the rate if it's really slow. Then look and see if your P waves and your QRSs have any kind of relationship. And in this case, they do not. You have P's just everywhere. So the only way to fix um, a dysrhythmia that has gone this wrong is through pacing, okay? Because atropine, atropine is not going to work. There is no communication whatsoever between your <coughs> SA node and your AV node. So if you were to give atropine, it would do absolutely nothing because all atropine does is it stops your vagus nerve from communicating with your SA node. Okay, well that's all well and good, but there's no communication between your SA node and your AV node in third degree. So the only way to fix third degree is to pace your patient until we can get a permanent pacer placed. Um, okay, so transcutaneous pacing is the only thing that we can do for a third degree. <clears throat> so next, underneath third degree, I have a very um, poorly <laughs> drawn out SVT. All right, so SVT has got a few characteristics that you need to remember. SVT is going to be fast. Um, SVT is going to have really, really tall, skinny QRS complexes. And I tried to kind of make that apparent here with my drawing. But it's going to be fast, it's going to be regular, tall, skinny QRS complexes, all right? Something you need to remember about SVT, SVT is kind of like a, an umbrella term, like COPD. Um, SVT is just any 
tachycardia that originates above the ventricles. So it can be an umbrella term for AFib, a flutter. All right, so it's it's just an umbrella term, and that's going to bring me to um, the treatments here in just a minute. But with SVT, um, our primary goal here is to get this rate slowed down because you know when your patient's heart rate is 150, they got no cardiac output. All right, and we know as nurses that the first treatments are going to be the least invasive first. So that's when, when your patient goes into SVT, you go in and you tell them, you know, to bear down. Or you go in there and you put ice on the bridge of their nose. Well, what we're trying to do there is we're trying to stimulate the vagus nerve, right? Where with atropine, we're trying to block the vagus nerve. With SVT, we're trying to stimulate the vagus nerve. So, you know, bear down, cough really hard, um, get the ice and put it on the bridge of their nose. Just remember, least invasive first. Then, the next treatment, and this is the one that I wanted to kind of focus on, <clears throat> which is, it's not really a treatment, but a denison, okay? So if your patient goes into SVT, just out of nowhere, that's gonna be called a paroxysmal SVT, right? So they've just, you know, they've been in a sinus rhythm or a sinus tack or whatever, then they go into SVT. Well, that's paroxysmal SVT, and that's what we call a re-entry dysrhythmia. And so what adenosine does, adenosine basically creates a heart block, all right? So it stops conduction through the AV node. And what we're hoping for when we push that adenosine is that it's going to induce that, that heart block, it's going to stop that conduction through the AV node and slow that rate down enough that we can identify what the underlying rhythm is. Because SVT is an umbrella term. We got to figure out, is this dysrhythmia originating from the atria or is it originating from the ventricles? So we get that adenosine and we push it, hopefully to slow it down enough so we can identify, correctly identify the underlying uh, dysrhythmia. Um, one thing I do want to mention about adenosine, y'all probably know this, but it has a very, very, very short half-life, okay? So that's why when you see nurses go in to push adenosine, they're going to slam it in, all right? So that's very different than what we do with like Lasix or morphine, right? But if you don't push it very, very fast, then the half-life, it's out of the system before you get that full dose into the patient, all right? So push it fast, real, real short half-life, all right? So when I talk about um, unmasking or uncovering the underlying dysrhythmia, we're kind of hoping that when that happens, after we push the adenosine, we're going to see something that looks like this. All right, so this is AFib, right? Um, so AFib and a flutter are kind of treated the same way, but I just ran out of room, um, so I wasn't able to draw a flutter, but you know, that AFib is extremely irregular. There's nothing regular about AFib. It's all over the place. You do have organized, um, you do still have an organized rhythm, but it's very, very regular. Sometimes it's, it's fast, sometimes it's not. You could have somebody that's in AFib with a rate of 70, all right? So we push the adenosine, the person's in SVT, and it reveals that they're in atrial fibrillation. So what do we do now? Well, if we've caught it early, then there are a few things that we can do. Um, but what I've got out here to the side, CCB, that stands for calcium channel blockers, and BB stands for beta blockers. So again, our primary goal is to slow the rate down. Now, if you have somebody that's in an AFib and We've, we've tried to convert them with cardioversion or whatever, but they're in a sustained atrial fibrillation, then you've got to consider anticoagulation, right? Because this person has no atrial kick. So blood is going to sit in those atria and pool, and it's going to clot. So if you have somebody that you catch in AFib early, and you can't get them converted out, 
then you're going to have to think about um, anticoagulation down the road. But the calcium channel blocker, usually cardizem, beta blockers, is just going to be used to kind of slow that rate down. And then finally, the last dysrhythmia I have is very recognizable here. <clears throat> this is the deadliest dysrhythmia on the planet. This is VTAC, all right? So, so far we've been talking about SVT, AFib, A flutter, which are atrial dysrhythmias, and VTAC obviously is originating from the ventricles. So, those dysrhythmias are going to be treated very, very differently. So, VTAC with a pulse, um, you can't just run in there and defibrillate your patient if they're still awake and alert and they have a pulse. So, we're going to treat um, VTAC with a pulse very differently. There's a couple of different options as far as medications that we look to for um, VTAC. So lidocaine, <clears throat> we use lidocaine for say patients who we know has had some kind of acute um, MI and they've had an ischemic episode and they go into VTAC after that. Lidocaine is going to be our drug of choice for that type of VTAC. What lidocaine does, basically it just kind of numbs the ventricles, okay? It kind of numbs the ventricles and it's going to hopefully prevent those ventricles from being overstimulated and control that VTAC. And then Cortarone, I know you've got patients that are on Cortarone. <coughs> um, it's the, uh, the anti-dysrhythmic of choice really for, for the vast majority of ventricular dysrhythmias. And then obviously, um, cardioversion, all right? Cardioversion is going to be the, the treatment of choice because if your patient is awake and alert, even if it's VTAC, we're not going to defibrillate, all right? We're going to cardiovert, big, big difference. So any of these dysrhythmias, starting with SVT, um, AFib, a flutter, uh, VTAC with a pulse, we would go for cardioversion if we couldn't get the patient out of the rhythm with some of these lesser invasive methods, all right? So that's just a real quick summary of the five kind of dysrhythmias that came to my mind as far as what you're gonna see in practice and the different medications that you're gonna to use to treat them. I hope you found the video helpful and Thanks again for watching my video today.